We stand for the call of worship. Holy God, this is Earth's quiet season, the season of waiting. We rest in the shelter of your love. This is the season of darkness, when we seek stars to guide us. We trust in the light of your promise. This is the season of solitude, when we listen for our own heart's rhythm. We find warmth in the signs of your presence. This is our season to make room, a time to make ready. For we shall join in the angels' chorus. Peace on earth, goodwill to all. Peace on earth, goodwill to all. May the light from the 
this candle overwhelm the world. May the light from this candle say to all that God's peace is coming on earth as it is already in heaven. Friends, be not afraid. God's peace is at hand. gathered as your people, God, knowing that we often fall short of your call in our lives. During this season of waiting, empower us to accept ourselves as you accept us. Allow us to surrender ourselves to your grace, your love, your omnipotent vision, and to become the people you envision us to be, people of hope, peace, joy, and love in a spirit of anticipation for your coming, hear our prayer. Merciful God, forgive that when we fall asleep, when you call us to watch and pray. We fail to see the signs of your coming. Christ our Savior, forgive that we are not watchful, we do not choose hope or plant the seeds of hopefulness. We fail to see the signs of your coming. Forgiving Spirit, forgive that in the rush of the Christmas season, we forget to stop and listen for the sound of angel voices. We forget to stop and look for a start to guide us to Christ. We fail to see the signs of God's presence. God over all, Christ within us, Spirit around us. Hear our prayer and send your messenger of peace to us and to your sleeping world. For the signs of your coming and the signs of your constant presence within and around us, we give you thanks.
in Christ across the street. Um, and we rejoice again in the partnership that we share. Um, and I have to tell you that this morning, the talk of St. Jacob's Lutheran was, wow, that was a really great party last night. So y'all throw a great party. Thank you for inviting us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Who needs a prophet anyway? Prophets have an annoying habit of pointing out flaws, airing family secrets, being just all around nuisances. They love to call us out when we stray from God and we've just lost sight of the truth. At best, they're a nuisance. At worst, they're meddling. Who needs messengers of, of discomfort, messengers of sacrifice? What good are they for? Wouldn't it be just best for them to get on their soapboxes and protest and preach and pronosticate somewhere or anywhere else but here? It's hard enough trying to be a good, upright, church-going, tithe-giving, Sunday school teaching person without one of these annoying prophets calling us to care for the poor, to look out for the downtrodden, to seek after justice and righteousness. I mean, don't we do enough anyway? It'd be nice if they would go bother some of the people in power. You know, the people who can actually do something for the poor and the needy. Why do prophets insist on bothering good people? But here they are, calling us again to repentance and forgiveness and hope. You'd think they were broken records, spinning the same thing over and over and over again. And here comes another one called John, the son of Zechariah. John the baptizer, some people call him. He's no ordinary prophet, though. He doesn't just preach that we need to repent. He has the nerve to insist that people go out to the muddy Jordan River and be baptized nonetheless. It would be nice if John sang a different tune for a change. He's always running around, repent this, prepare God. Haven't we heard that message before? Every single advent? He persists. Like crazy old Isaiah, preaching about paths being made straight and valleys and mountains being filled and made flat. The thing about straightening crooked places and valleys being filled and mountains being brought low is that we like our paths crooked and our valleys deep and our mountains high. We like the way things are and the way they've always been. Who needs a prophet anyway? Well, we do. We need prophets. The people who sit in darkness, in deep despair, they need prophets. The people who look around and see destruction and desolation, they need prophets. The people who have no voice and no rights and no hope, they need prophets. Because prophets proclaim the word of God. Prophets proclaim a new and better way. Prophets are truth tellers to a world that's longing and praying and looking for glimpses of hope. Our world needs prophets. Prophets are harbingers of hope, and hope is found in the coming of the one we await. The message foretold by John, it breaks into our world with a deafening silence. It shatters the dark of despair with the light of love. Who needs prophets? We do. We need prophets. We need those annoying, nagging nuisances that call us to be better followers of Jesus. 
writer Rachel Held Evans reminded us. Biblically speaking, a prophet isn't a fortune teller or a soothsayer who predicts the future, but rather a truth teller who sees things as they really are, past, present, and future, and then challenges their community to both accept that reality and to imagine a better one. We need the voice of one crying out in the wilderness because things happen in the wilderness. In the wilderness, the needs are raw and real, and sweet words and hollow sentiments are just not enough there. We need prophets, especially when we've gotten so full of ourselves that we neglect to see the orphan and the refugee and the migrant and the widow and the stranger. We need prophets to call us back to God, back to a place where hope is found not only in church, but in the world around us, in the interaction of strangers, in the joys of diversity and difference, in the radicalness of love. Like Jesus and John, we are tasked with holding lightly to the things that do not matter in order to open to a hope-filled future to which God calls us. Now more than ever, our communities, our nation, our world are in desperate need of the glimmer of hope that's found in Jesus Christ. Now more than ever, we need to not only hear the cries of the prophets, we need to take on the mantle of the prophets. See, we as the church, the people of God, the followers of Jesus, we are called to claim our prophetic birthright and be the voice of the voiceless, the hope of the hopeless, the love to the loveless. Often in the church, we can feel small, powerless, wondering how we're going to survive, being concerned about ourselves rather than those in need. But God's prophetic grace often falls on not the powerful or the mighty, but on extraordinarily ordinary people who turn the world upside down and then right side up. We're called to remember that we're not a group of people who all believe exactly the same things. We are a group of people, though, who are caught up in God's plan of redemption and salvation with Jesus right in the center. The question facing us as Christians who seek to follow where Jesus leads and to heed the, court, the voice of John is not, do we need prophets? The question we must answer is, are we willing to be prophets? Are we willing to speak God's word? Are we willing to let God's light shine through us so much that we can show this world a new and better way? Are we willing to be prophetic enough to walk out in faith and break bread with people who may not look like us or talk like us or vote like us or speak like us? Because that's the good news that we have to share. That's the prophetic vision that has the power to transform this world. There are prophets in our midst. In fact, there's one sitting next to you or in front of you. Look around. Listen. Keep awake. Yes, there is still darkness and despair and shattered dreams. There are still sins to be forgiven and enemies to turn into friends. It may not look like it, and it may not sound like it, it may not even feel like it, but in Jesus Christ, love has already won. The light of love, the glimmer of hope, has broken through the gloom. 
The crooked places have been made straight. The valleys and the mountains have been made smooth. The rough places have been made plain, except for Main Street in New Salem. <laughs> Sorry. Look around. You'll see the salvation of our God breaking through in a thousand little pinpricks of light. Tune your ears to the voices crying from the wilderness. Pay attention to the weirdos who speak of good news and forgiveness and repentance and hope. Be the prophet who points to Jesus coming once more into a world that needs him so. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.
Through the ages, your song of liberation has impregnated us with your hope for a world where those considered last and least are first and most. Violence is overcome by the power of your ancient love, and all siblings work together for peace. You bring longings to birth and send prophets to awaken us to your approaching advent among us. We thank you for those who, like Mary, have the strength and courage to give birth to your love in the world. For those who, like the shepherds, dare to seek out the child of Bethlehem. And for those who, like the wise ones, actively challenge violence and oppressive powers. We praise you that your everlasting light is shown to us in womb and tomb, in cradle and cross, in tenderness and compassion. We join in the Advent prayer of all your people. O oh, come, come, Emmanuel. And as we wait and watch for your coming among us, we proclaim your goodness. At this time, we also remember all with whom you would have us share this feast. We pray for all who are in sorrow or in pain, all who are ill or alone, all who are close to our hearts, all our sisters who live with fear, oppression, or hunger, all whose lives have been blighted by violence, racism, or poverty, for all whom the world counts as last and least. We pray for the church and its many ministries, for nations as they strive for peace and justice, for an end to violence against women. God of hope, make this bread the means of our rebuilding, this wine the medium of our transformation, this table the foundation of our renewal, and this community, the place of our rebirth. Amen. At this time, we remember Jesus, who on the night before he died took a loaf of bread, gave you thanks, broke it and said, take and eat. Whenever you do this, remember me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant. Remember me. Gracious God, breath of peace, source of love, we pray for your spirit. Make, Make us one. Make us the broken whole. Make us despite death alive. And so we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. And so we join with our siblings around the world in the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ. The bread of life. The lifeblood of Christ. The cup of blessing. Let us eat and drink together for our strengthening in the faith and for the sake of the world.
tears so that you will reach out to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with foolishness, foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world, foolishness so that you will do what others claim cannot be done. Amen.